Hello everybody and welcome to this video lecture on relational databases. Uh, this lecture is mostly for beginners, I mean people who study databases, people who study database design, but I really think it will be useful for broader audience as well. It will be useful for many existing database developers who may be already working with relational databases and even these people will find some interesting sometimes uh, new facts for them as well. Uh, you know how it happens very often in most of uh, modern software products, software technologies, etc. Very often we actually work many years with these products, but still may do not know all features they offer. And very often we again working for a long time with them, but still don't understand some fundamentals of this product. And this is pretty common and I wouldn't say it's normal, but it's just reality of our days because we have so many products, so many technologies, so it's simply impossible to know everything. So everybody is welcomed here and I think that everybody will find something interesting. And another important note, as you can see in the title, this lecture provides a so-called informal introduction into this topic. What do I mean by informal introduction? I mean that uh, relational databases, relational database theory is actually based on pretty strict science. So there is a lot of science behind this. And uh, because of this fact, there are many very formal definitions for some terms we will be using. There are many formulas, theorems, etc. There are many scientific articles on relational databases. Actually, not articles. There are many big books on them. So, it's actually, there is a lot of information. So, anybody looking for some strict definition will probably find them on internet, in books, and on other materials. And I will be more concentrated on uh, informal introduction, which means that I will be more concentrated on essence of each term, uh, what it means for you, what is the practical use of this, and uh, how would you actually use it in your database development activity, and how will it affect you. So once again, welcome to this lecture. Now let's talk about the role of relational data model and where it stands now currently in the database world. Uh, first of all, it's very important to know that relational data model is one of the most classic and well-known database models. This database model existed for many years and was used by tremendous amount of companies, businesses, so it's so-called battle-proven database model, which means that it was actually tested on big variety of projects and in most cases it did prove to be successful. Another important note is that this is a pretty fundamental model and it means that it has strong scientific background behind it. There is actually a theory called it relational algebra, which supports this model. Also, model is somewhat based in set theory, which is branch of math. We are not going to discuss all scientific uh, features of this model, but it's very important to know that this model, I would say, is not standalone. It has some kind of scientific background as well. At the same time, these days, relational data model has some strong competitors. Let's talk a little bit about uh, strongest competitors of this model. I think you're probably already familiar with the term NoSQL. You may heard it uh, from your colleagues, you may saw it on internet and uh, maybe on some seminars. This term became popular recently. Uh, I personally think that this term is a bit questionable. And one of the reasons for this, it's very non-specific. So when somebody says NoSQL, it's very difficult to understand what exactly they're talking about. 
and it's quite possible that you will see two people talking about the so-called noise scale product and they will be talking about very different product which probably even have nothing in common. So I will try to be more specific when naming competitors and instead of using the term NoSQL, I will present you two particular database models which are competing with relational more than anybody else. First of them is called a document-oriented database model. Uh, this model and uh, database is based on this model, store information in form of document, which is set of field of variable structure and some hierarchy within this document. We are not going to go through details of document-oriented databases because uh, they are beyond the scope of this lecture. And I'm planning to record separate lecture on document-oriented databases, so there will be lecture uh, devoted to them specifically. At this point, I will only mention that this is model which is competing with relational database model. Another competitor is now shown on the right panel, and it's called graph database model or graph database. This kind of database is store information in the form of graph. So all pieces of information are stored within nodes, and these nodes are connected with links, where each link has some tag which explains the nature of relationship. Once again, we are not going to go through all details of graph databases, because there will be separate lecture on graph databases alone. Now, interesting note that because of this two strong competitors, and by the way, these are not only competitors, there are other database models which are also competing, they are simply not as popular as these two which I presented, but there is actually a big variety of database models available these days. And because of all this competition, uh, the role of relational database model has little bit diminished compared to what it was before. It doesn't mean that the role became insignificant. It simply means that previously almost every database was relational. Uh, well, when I say almost, I mean that not uh, exactly 100%. There were always some other projects available, but maybe something like roughly like 97% of all databases were relational, and most of the companies were using relational databases. This is not true these days. And the reason of this is obvious. We just uh, explained it, that there are some strong competitors of relational data model. So some companies uh, move to other database model. And uh, all variety of database model is in use currently. However, relational is still in great use. It's still respected database model and it's still useful. It's still actually bringing success to many businesses. At the same time, all these uh, non-relational uh, database products are being very aggressively marketed these days. And uh, because everybody who is presenting their product uh, want to claim that their product is the best in the world, some people will even uh, use terminology which will go as far as saying that relational database model is dead these days. This is obviously overstatement. It's not dead, it's still alive, it's still functional. But the role of this model is obviously less than it was in the past. So this is why some people may claim that it's uh, not as good as it was before. Although, in my opinion, it's still pretty strong and it's still good. Uh, now, I cannot guarantee that you will end up working with relational database because what you will be working with will uh, heavily depend on the nature of your projects, uh, your business needs, and maybe in certain extent it will depend on your tastes as well. Obviously, different people, different developers have different tastes. However, what I can actually state with big confidence is that it's still definitely was to study relational data model. Why is that? Because it actually helps to understand databases in general. It helps to see uh, what problems exist in databases, what challenges exist, how this uh, challenge has been approached and addressed. And for educational purposes, it's certainly very 
useful to study this kind of database model. Now, the most important concept in the relational database is table. Table is actually a structure which you currently see on your screen, and we will talk about table in more details in next slides. And table is the center of universe in relational database. Table is all what relational database is about. Everything which is good in relational databases is due to the fact that it stores data in tables. And everything which is bad is also due to the fact that it stores everything in tables. So let's actually look at tables in more details. So we now know that tables are very important in relational databases. But, but are they only used it in databases? It actually looks like tables came from real life and they are very important in real life as well. And by real life, I do not only mean uh, anything to do with computers or with uh, software, but just regular real life. Uh, tables were used by people for many centuries, so many generations of people used them, and they did find them very useful. The most well-known and probably the oldest use of tables was in so-called accounting. So in accounting, in financial activities, tables were used actually by many previous generations of accountants. Uh, another name of accounting is actually bookkeeping. And what it was about, there were some books and what was in these books, uh, what was on every page of this book, there were tables in these books. The tables in accounting look at like the one I'm showing currently on the screen. And this is obviously a simplified form of accounting table. Real accounting table were more complex than the one I'm currently showing. But at least it, it shows some idea why table was useful in accounting. So table probably was recording certain transactions and that in it was separately recording whether it's debit or credit transaction and it had separate columns for this. Now, the most important thing actually within this table was the one which I'm currently pointing to. It's actually bottom portion of the table, which says balance. And this is actually where tables came, most powerful tables are capable of showing balance. Uh, at least it's very easy to show balance if everything is put in table. Balance is simply total of all values uh, shown in certain column in a table. In this example, uh, it is uh, balance of debit and balance of credit, and it allows you to see actually what was your total debit or credit, so what was your money intake or, or money uh, or, or amount of money you spent within a certain period of time. It could be balance for the day, balance for the week, balance for the month, for the quarter, whatever balance you needed. So first of all, this balance is useful itself because you simply know your financial picture much better. Uh, second use of this, and that was actually one of the reasons why accountants of previous generation used tables. Uh, second use of this was to spot any error. So if you know your total balance, total debit and total credit, and you know uh, total amount of money you currently have, whether in your bank account or as a cash or in any other form, you can see whether these two numbers match together. If they do not match, you immediately see that you have some error in your accounting. So either you miss it something or you have some wrong number in one of your lines in your table. So you immediately see some errors and obviously can correct this error. Now, the table I'm showing on the screen is only showing uh, some kind of vertical balance where numbers are summarized vertically. Uh, in accounting tables, there are some horizontal balances itself. So some items within a row, within a row in the table could be summarized and shown on the right. So these are also useful balances. And normally, they not only use useful themselves in terms of they show some value, but they also pointed out to possible errors. And this is why tables were used by accountant, and that was way before computers were invented. So it's actually nothing to do with computers. It's actually table itself is very useful. It was used on just regular paper. Say accountant were actually having some big spreadsheets of papers where they were 
where draw, drawing these tables and uh, using and calculating all these balances I was talking about. Uh, yet another interesting example of table use, once again not related to databases but showing the power of the table, is web design. Those of you who are familiar with web design certainly know that there is table tag within HTML language. Uh, this table tag is uh, also representing table, but this time table is not used in the same way as it would be used in relational database. It's not used actually for keeping data. It's mostly used for rearranging objects on the page. And normally page uh, which has table has some kind of nice layout, nice and accurate and well-ordered layout. So tables are used to arrange some pictures, some uh, text fragments, some controls on the, uh, on the page, and it's nice and useful. And this is another example of how powerful this table structure is. And let's see yet another example from real life. And this time it could be even example of example from your own real life. And once again, at this point, I am not even talking about using computers. I am talking about how you just do it uh, if you were doing it manually. Uh, let's suppose you have some kind of home improvement project and you want to paint walls in your house. And you obviously need to do some kind of planning for this uh, kind of project. You can use different approaches for this. You can use so-called random planning where you simply recall what you need to do and you write it down somewhere. So, for example, you decided to paint and you recall that you need to send your wall before you paint. So, you write this task, send wall, on some paper clip and probably stick it into your fridge in your kitchen. Then you recall that you need to paint wall in bedroom one and so on. You see all this task. You need to buy brushes. You need to buy a ladder to stand on. So, once you actually recall you need to do something, you write it down. And also, at some point, you understand that you need to research paints before buying them. It means that you need to go to the internet and see what paints are available. And uh, obviously, as you can see, all the tasks are coming actually in different order from the order of how they will be performed. So you just write them down once you recall it. You have everything written down and... Um, uh, attach it to your fridge, for example. And there is alternative approach to this, which is very different, and I will call it table-based planning. And this time you put all this information into table. You can probably already see the difference. You know, if you look at right portion of the screen and previous left portion of the screen, you see actually how differently it even looks like. And it's not just looking differently, it's now more useful. And data are more organized, it's a definitely more useful data, and you can get much more of this data. And uh, the tool which organized this data was actually a table. It's table which made them uh, not only look better, but even uh, to be organized better. And now you have actually new opportunities which you didn't have before. For example, you can not only write down your task, you not only you order them in a certain order, but you also add additional columns. I added column time, where I put actually my estimated time for this action. I added column cost. And with this column cost, I now have benefit, which we already saw on previous slide, when we were talking about balance. I can now summarize this column, and I can very easily find out what is my total cost of my project. And if any item changes, I can easily recalculate my total cost of the project. And I also added one, just as another example, actually, what opportunities we have now. I added uh, two other uh, interesting column. I added column code on the left, which actually assigns certain kind of uh, two-character code to every task. And on the right, I added column, column depends on where I write code, which this particular task depends on. It means that this task cannot start before the task it depends on has been already completed. And you can see now that uh, 
it actually it's, it helps to organize all this task and otherwise it will be difficult to order them in proper order for example i now see that i need to start from researching panes because this task doesn't depend on anything else i can start researching at any time however the next task by panes actually has code rp as a dependency code which means that it depends on researching of pain so i can only buy pains after i research them i cannot buy pains before i know what pains i want to buy and so on and for example you can see that one of the uh, last tasks paint wall in bedroom one now has three dependencies it depends on whether you already do sending of your wall it also depends whether you already purchased your paints and it, it depends whether you have brushes for this, so you cannot start this task after, before you did all these things. Now, a very interesting question, and could you do the same actually using model shown on the left? I mean, these paper clips, which you wrote independently and uh, attached somewhere. Actually, the answer to this, yes, you can write this information there. For example, you can also write cost of your project items on this um, model. However, it will be very difficult to put it together. So usefulness of this information will be much less than usefulness of information which is uh, uh, which could be actually uh, which could be obtained if you compile it all your data into table. So, for example, if you write cost, it will be very difficult to calculate total of this cost. And the reason why it's difficult, because you will be always forgetting which item has already been included and which item is not included yet. So when you calculate your total, very often you will miss something or you will calculate some item twice. In table, it wouldn't happen because in table they line it up so perfectly so you can actually summarize them without making any error. So this actually shows you power of table. And another interesting example, possibly also from your real life, and this would be the case if you are a software developer. If you are a software developer, you may actually recall uh, and take this information from your own memory that there were times when you were working in, uh, on some project and your customer your client uh, submitted you some data they wanted to work on in the form of table. And there would be cases when data which were provided for you were not in form of table, but were in form of some kind of verbal explanation, in some kind of, uh, I don't know, some cause, another kind of explanation which is different from table. You can actually recall and probably that would be true for most cases that when data were provided in form of table, your project was easier to develop, easier to understand, and easier to maintain. Projects where data were not provided you as table normally actually having some difficulties in developing. And after we have seen so many examples of tables in real life, let's go back to our topic, which is relational database. A table in relational database is somewhat similar to what table is in real life, but it's also a little bit different. It's different because it's uh, better defined in relational database. So, so table in relational database is certain structure, which is well-defined, well-structured horizontally. At the same time, it's not well-defined vertically, so you have pretty big freedom in vertical direction. So what this all means? What means well-defined horizontally? It means that there are three things which are almost always the same, meaning they are very stable. And these three, three things are number of columns. So you have the same number of columns. You have the same column names. And probably the most important part, you have well-defined column data type. So each column has certain data type. And Whatever data type you have chosen, it should be always the same, meaning that it's the same for all rows in the table. So all values in the column are of the same data type. For example, column A could be integer. It means that all values are integer in this column. And column B could be text. And obviously, it means that all values in this column are text. Uh, but uh, vertically, you have pretty big freedom, and it means that uh, you can have many records, you can have few records, you can have just one record. Uh, 
you have you can have more than a million records or you can also have zero records you can have empty table uh, obviously this table will not store anything but it will be a perfect relational table and it could be used in as part of some queries as well at least it, it's not going to throw any error or any exception now, a uh, little bit more about uh, how a stable table is. I say that it's not supposed to change. Uh, does it mean that it never changes at all? Does it mean that once you define it, that it will be the same uh, for the rest of your life? Uh, probably it doesn't mean that. It's not that extreme, really. Uh, well, in ideal world, we do not want the table to ever change, but we do not live in ideal world, we live in real world, and in real world, actually, there are new many requirements, some challenges, so sometimes you will be actually changing table structure. And when I say, uh, well, define it, it never changes, I actually do not mean physically never changes. I mean that it doesn't change under normal circumstances. So it doesn't change as a part of regular business. And in order to explain it better, I would actually prefer example of uh, some kind of uh, college classroom. In this classroom, we have uh, some things which are variable, which are changing all the time. And we have something which is very stable. And what is changing every time is content of this room. People in this room are always different. They come in, in they come in out. So it's actually some kind of stuff which, which changes uh, during uh, normal business hours and during normal line of business. It's not changing under any exceptional circumstances. At the same time, room has walls and windows. And by walls, I mean actually traditional wall mean made of concrete i do not mean flexible walls which some uh, college classrooms actually have so these walls and windows they are not changing under normal circumstances however they could be changed for example you can run some construction or remodeling project and within this project you can actually change uh, layout of your windows you can knock down your walls and build them elsewhere so you can actually change it uh, so this kind of thing is very similar to database. Uh, you can really change it, but you really need to, uh, first of all, you need to actually do, to spend significant amount of efforts to do this. Just think again about this uh, college classroom example. In order to change walls or windows, it probably would be a very expensive project. And obviously, it's not something which is happening every day. It's hardly happening uh, maybe once in 10 years. And another important thing, and this is actually also similarity with databases, if you need to change layout of your classroom, you need to stop your business. So you need to stop classes in this room. So you cannot actually rebuild your walls or change windows when people are in the room. So in, so in this case, uh, you will be stopping your business, doing your project, and then resuming your business later. And exactly the same thing is happening with databases. If you need to change your database structure, you will need to run so-called database conversion projects. So you need to probably write some software which will, will do in your structure because you are not going to change it manually. It's not realistic. You need to write some code for this. These are your expenses, actually, for this, because if you write in code, it's... Uh, means that you spend some kind of development type on this and it in turn means that it's also spending money because development time costs something for, for the company. And you also need to stop your business. So whatever actually business you have, for example, your database is powering website. In this case, your website could be down for a certain time, maybe a few hours, maybe even more when you're restructuring your database or you're running some kind of another application, and, and at the time when you change your database structure, your application is not going to work, it's not going to be in business. Uh, we now know that we have certain freedom in vertical direction in our table. However, there is one important exception to this freedom, and this exception is you are not allowed to have duplicates. Duplicates are records or rows in the table which are exactly the same. For example, I just shown duplicates in this table on the screen. And when we say the same, we mean that entire record is the same. Uh, 
one particular column can have duplicates, uh, but if some record is exactly the same as some another record in the table, this is actually duplicated record, which is not allowed in relational database. When I say not allowed, I do not mean that you cannot technically create it. Most of uh, relational database products will not actually block you from creating this. So technically you will be able to create it. However, if you do, you will have a lot of troubles in the future. First of all, you will have troubles when running queries against this database. So the rule is simply avoid duplicates. Other than that, you have pretty big freedom. So at this point, we already know that relational database keeps all data in tables. And this brings interesting question. Uh, are data in real life actually tabular? So do they fit into table? Well, the answer to this is actually variable because sometimes uh, data you have are already tabular. And that was example with accounting system we were talking about earlier. In this case, you already have tables, so you don't even have any problem with this. Sometimes your data will be partially tabular, means that uh, part of this data could be represented as table, but another part maybe not. Uh, it may be not convenient to represent it as, as a table. And sometimes you have uh, totally non-tabular structures or even uh, data of some kind of undefined shape means that they do not even have any particular structure. Uh, let's actually review some typical examples uh, which you will be facing in real life. The first one uh, currently shown, it, and it is actually a very well-known situation when you have customers. Every customer has uh, one or more orders, and actually number of orders for every customer is different. Somebody will have only one order, some customer will have many orders, and each order has one or more items. This is actually a so-called hierarchical structure. You, so you have three levels, customer, order, and item. And as you remember, table is flat structure. Table doesn't have any hierarchy. Another example, which looks like it's not table at all, it's so-called graph structure, which you currently see in the right portion of the screen. Uh, in this structure, uh, there are no even definite levels, so you cannot say that there is a higher level, there is a low level. All uh, these components are connected to each other in a certain way, and they could be linked from any node to any other node. And finally, you can have even this kind of data, which is currently shown at the bottom of the screen. So this is actually unstructured or poorly structured data where you have data of all kinds, of all types. As you can see, some of them are strings, some of them are numbers, uh, and there are hexadecimal numbers as well. Some of them are dates, some of them are times, and uh, they don't have any structure at all. It's just some kind of you know, uncontrolled pile of data. So obviously, at this point, you may develop an uh, impression like this. You may think, hey, he's talking about tables and it's very nice to show it in lecture, it's very nice to show this data in screen, they will look uh, very accurate, very organized, but it maybe has nothing to do with real life because all my data I am dealing with are not tabular. So is this kind of relational database, database model useful at all or is it useless? Uh, well, actually this concern is partially true. And I mean the first part of concern is true. So the first part, uh, the first statement was that in real life you very often have data which are not tabular. So this is perfectly true. This, and this is really what will happen. The next statement that relational database is not useful in this case is not true because relational database can handle this as well. Uh, you may be very surprised to learn that all the structures which are currently shown on the screen, including many others, can be actually perfectly fit into tables. Even though they do not look like tables, especially the bottom one, it looks like it has nothing to do with tables at all, but they could be actually fit into table. Even the bottom portion could be fit into table, although it would be actually uh, correct to note that if you have 
unstructured data like the one which is shown in this bottom portion, your then, then relational database may be not your best choice. So, it's, so it will be able to handle it. It will be able to store this kind of data, but it may not show its best features on this kind of data. Relational database are traditionally uh, stronger on well-defined and well-structured data. However, it doesn't mean that they cannot handle unstructured data. They actually can. And later, in the uh, next parts of this video, we will actually see how they can do this. And this graph structure could be actually perfectly handled by relational database as well. Even though there is a special database, we already mentioned it, it's called graph database, which could be maybe even better for this. However, relational database is also not that bad even with such structures. And all this process of fitting of your data of different types into tables is called database design. So database design is essentially when you decide what tables and what columns in tables you will have. Or to be more precise, this is the most important part of database design because there are actually some other issues you need to resolve during the database design stage. But uh, deciding tables and columns probably will be the most important part of this. Uh, now, obviously, it's very uh, database design is very important thing, and so everything in your database, your database wellness in general, means data accuracy, data performance will depend on what have you done during the database design, what columns and what tables you decided to have. Uh, it is very often overlooked stage. So very often you have uh, some kind of poor understanding of what data you will have. You may not have enough information from customer. You may be not sure about this. And very often uh, some companies decide, let's do some, some quick and temporary designs and let's develop some software and let's improve it later. Uh, this approach is... Uh, actually wrong because of two reasons. First of them is probably already known to you. We already talked it, uh, before that database conversion is a very difficult task. It means if you fill your database with data, later convert it to different structure will be very different and painful. However, there is also another important reason for this. And this reason is a database actually drives your entire application quality. Uh, many parts of your application will be accessing database. Database is often central part of your application and good database design brings everything up. So it makes everything else actually to be designed better and vice versa. Bad database design almost always means that all other parts of your application are also poorly designed. So this is why it's important. However, I cannot promise you it will never happen that you will do something quick and dirty with this. Uh, if you start to work with databases, sometimes your management will be pushing you to do this. Or if you already work it before, you might have already been in a situation where you designed something without proper understanding what your data would be. So in this case, you probably already know what consequences you face it afterwards. Uh, within this lecture, we will actually learn many database design approaches. So we will learn how to fit all kind of data into tables and columns effectively. And this approach to database design, which we just learned, uh, I mean fitting uh, all kind of data into tables and columns, is specific to relational databases. However, uh, database design is also important uh, for other kind of databases as well, not only for relational. The only difference is that in non-relational databases, it's done differently. It's not done by fitting data into tables and columns. How it's done in other databases is beyond the scope of this lecture. So the important thing to note once again is that it's important for any database product. Although in relational databases, it is maybe more important than in other databases. Uh, very soon we will move to more practical examples. We will be writing some code. We will be using particular database product and we will be executing this code. Uh, I understand that lecture in the form of just whiteboard presentation could be a little bit boring. 
And this will change in next part of this video where we will, we will be doing some practical examples. However, there is still one important topic which we cannot move ahead without, we cannot skip this topic, and this topic is primary key. The primary key is very important concept in the relational database. An example of primary key is currently shown as a leftmost column in, the, in this table with the name ID. A primary key essentially is unique identifier for each column. The values of primary key are always unique. Every record in table will have different value. And another thing for, which is true for primary key, it's always assigned. It means that this value is never empty. So this value always exists. Every record is obliged to have primary key assigned. Uh, primary key is very different from record number. Although it might look like record number, but it is not actually record number. And there is even more important note about this, that uh, relational databases in general do not have concept of record number. They do not maintain record number. It means that in general, in relational database, you cannot make request like this. You cannot say, give me record number three, or give me record number five, or update record number 10. Because your database uh, is not able to locate record by number. And this is actually one of the reasons why primary key exists. Uh, it allows us to get to a particular record in very reliable way. If we know primary key of this record, we can always request uh, this. We can always read this. We can always update, delete this record or whatever we want to do with this record. And for example, if there wasn't primary key, how would we request particular record? Uh, if, for example, we request uh, records in this table by first name, like give me records for John, Obviously, it will return many records. If we make our request more specific, for example, we request for John Clark. So in this case, we provide both first name and last name in our request. It also not guaranteed to return one record. Obviously, there could be people where both first name and last name are the same. So unlike primary keys, they are not guaranteed to be unique. And primary key is always unique. And yet another example, let's say we will request by salary. It's even worse. We will have even more records in this case. And uh, as you already understand, we cannot request it by record number either by that simple fact that it simply doesn't exist. So the only reliable way to request particular record is to issue request like give me record with ID equal to three. So this time, this request is valid, unlike the previous request, which was saying, give me record number three. And uh, another illustration of the fact that uh, primary key and record number is not the same thing is the fact that there could be gaps. As you can see, we have records, uh, sorry, we have primary keys one, two, three, and the next one is eight. So the record with primary key eight is actually staying at position number four. So this is another example. So record number and primary key are very different things. Uh, primary key could be either natural or artificial. Uh, this table, which we currently see, is actually an example of, of so-called artificial primary key. Artificial means that it didn't exist originally in our data. When we were inserting this data into tables, we created it, we, we artificially assigned it. And uh, our people, all this John Clark, John Smith, they didn't have this number uh, until we inserted them into our database. So it's artificial because it's created by us or by our database product. Uh, there could be also design based on natural primary key. And this is the case when your data already have some kind of column which is always unique and sometimes it's useful but let's see actually whether it would be better to use artificial primary key even if there is some natural primary key is available uh, for example if we are talking about uh, table with people who live in united states uh, the possible choice for uh, Natural primary key will be so-called SSN, which stands for Social Security Number. It looks like it could be a very good choice because it does comply with all requirements for primary key. It's always unique. 
no two people will ever have the same SSN, and it never changes. So once SSN assigned, it is always the same. So is it really ideal choice for primary key? Actually, it's not. And this is because, despite the fact that it's always unique, it still has many problems. For example, there could be cases when somebody doesn't have uh, sorry, somebody doesn't have SSN at all. It's actually possible. Or another problem: this SSN may be not available. So they have SSN, but when you insert records, you don't necessarily know their social security number. And it shows uh, how artificial key is way more convenient because. You always know it. You don't need actually to guess what it would be. You just assign next number. If your previous choice of primary key was 15, the next record you insert will be 16, and another next record will be 17, and so on. So you do not need that somebody brings it to you like SSN. You don't need to request it. It's always available, and it's very convenient to use. So in general, Artificial key tends to be better choice, although if you really have very good candidate for natural primary key, you can use it as well. And there is one more note, uh, and this again about uh, the statement that uh, we don't have record numbers. Uh, those of you who, who know SQL may actually argue that there is a function called row number in SQL, so you may ask, is it really not... Uh, example of row number, is it not record number? Actually, it's not, because row number function in, in SQL returns logical uh, number. It's not physical number. It's not, it's not physical position of record in your table. So as a general rule, uh, relational database doesn't know anything about record number. And uh, from the point of view of data type, uh, primary key could have any data type, but there are two data types which are most popular choices for primary key and most natural. Uh, one of them you already know. This is integer column with onto in incremental values when you simply assign sequential numbers. And this is actually an example which is currently shown. Another very interesting and also very popular choice is GUID. GUID stands for Global Unique Identifier, and those of you who are software developers are already probably familiar with this technology. This technology allows to uh, create unique numbers regardless of on where or when they were created. So on any computer, at any place, at any time, this number will be unique. So this choice is uh, very popular these days, especially because of rise of popularity of cloud technologies. With cloud technologies, you have uh, so many geographically distributed databases. So you have databases which are working at different locations. And if they are working independently, for example, if there is some big company, big corporation uh, who has many affiliates, People could be inserting their records independently in different offices, and they need some tool to uh, have to make sure that their primary key are always unique. Later, you could be merging these records into some central database, for example, in some database located in your head headquarters, and uh, these records will never collide. They will never create duplicates because uh, GUID identifiers are always unique. So this is another popular choice, and uh, integer uh, auto-incremental field is also very popular. This is end of part one of this video, and now you are invited to watch part two, which will be devoted to challenges when creating even a single table. See you later.